As being a proud British man, I want to play a game which shows how the Royal Navy destroys all the other navies of the world. Rule of the Waves 3 gives me that enjoyment. Having been a Rule the Waves player since the second instalment, where you had to pay for a sketchy ass website, I have a basic understanding of how Microsoft Excel what I mean how Rule the Waves 3 plays, which hopefully I'll be able to explain. The game is a turn-based naval strategy game with a real-time tactical gameplay element that is one of the best parts of the game. Also, if I got a fiver for all the times that my friends on Steam have said, why am I playing this Excel spreadsheet game? I would have enough to do an actual Microsoft Excel spreadsheet course at my local college. To show you how to play, I'll show you my latest game, playing as Britain. So to start, I will select 1900s as the 1890s is basically a local London night fight until one person uses a torpedo at point blank range. Picking a name is also very important. They gave me Fisher, who is basically the father of Dreadnoughts, which is cool, but I have a better name. With that out of the way, time to do some settings. All the other countries need to be put in their place automatically, and I want to harshly deal with countries who think they can have a go at me. So we can now build our legacy fleet. First off, building your pre-dreadnought battleships first. Uh, what's a pre-dreadnought? <laughs> Basically, they are battleships before 1906 that were the biggest and heaviest of the time, with many different guns on board to combat any ships that it came up against. The guns of the time were pretty meh and couldn't penetrate thick metal, so they were real slugging matches at the beginning. With that out of the way, here's what I made. The Rodney class pre-dreadnought. We have minus one quality 12 inch guns, six inch secondary guns, and 11 inches of belt armor and nine inches of turret armor. It's important to remember that guns can only penetrate a certain amount. You have gun data available, which tells you how much belt armor and deck armor that the caliber can actually penetrate through. Tertiary guns and torpedoes on battleships are worthless in my opinion. 18 knots was standard of the time. What are knots? How speed is measured in terms of ships and boats, not getting into that. A reduction in conning tower armour is a great weight saving scheme, but does mean the superstructure will take more damage and increase the likelihood of confusion in communications with other ships. Moving on to the armoured cruiser. They were large ships that were both relatively armoured and had big guns, but smaller in both to a pre-dreadnought. They were used in far off stations to protect assets that were not easily reached by battleships and could run away from one if they did appear. My design was called the Europa, and as you can see, it is as fast as 23 knots and had 10 inch guns, quality minus one. Light cruisers are smaller versions of armoured cruisers. Through history, they served in a variety of roles, primarily as convoy escorts and destroyer command ships, but also as scouts and fleet support vessels for battle fleets. Mine, however, a little on the slow side for my liking, but with 5 inch quality zero guns I think it packs a good enough punch against other light cruisers and destroyers. The last ship for now we must create is destroyers, the backbone of our trade protection. In 1900 we can only create them up to 400 tons, so there is not much we can do but the build is to make sure it's got 27 plus knots and can carry lots of torpedoes. With my fleet now completed, and the copious number of ships needed for foreign station postings being complete, we can now start the game. Here's how I cheat. After getting more money, I need to put all my ships into their stations. This will require a lot of microing and remembering where all the ships are, as well as remembering to rebuild the ships and then manually send them back. I also created divisions, which are ships grouped together under a divisional commander. All major ships from light cruisers up have captains, which will have their own traits and ability levels. Another feature we need to keep an eye on is in the top right, the tension meter. It grows and declines throughout your time playing based on random events that you can control or through historical animosity between two countries. Research is affected by how much is being spent on it with a maximum of 12% of the monthly budget available to be used on it. Doctrine affects the fighting capability of the Navy, whether you want to work on their gunnery training for a year or save that money for more ships. Now that it is all complete, I can now advance a month and see what happens. No for fun. As you can see, random shit happens. It is very random and can come at the worst time. And that is about it. With time, 
research will give way to better ships and it's all about balancing the book. Now that I've built this navy, it's now time to show it off. I was expecting to focus on Germany being my main enemy, so focused around a home fleet in the North Sea and a med fleet as well as foreign station fleets in the Far East and Africa. However, America felt like they needed another War of 1812 to even it up a bit. I tried my best to call for reduction in tensions, however, this random event happened which would catapult us into a war. I made the necessary preparations for war by transferring more ships into the area of the American East Coast and the Caribbean, as well as Southeast Asia and West Coast America. Got my trade protection in place already and I rolled on to the next month. Action near Cuba, which I was surprised that America accepted. As you can see, this is a battle map. A turn is a minute in game and a battle will last from 400 minutes to well over a thousand, depending on the battle. Don't worry, time can be sped up and the battles don't really last that long. We don't have to manually move the fleets thankfully, we control the flagship and the AI control the other ships and their role in the fleet, like screening, scouting or supporting the flagship. On the left side we have general info and logs about what our ship is doing, like firing and what damage is sustained in the turn. We can also click on all the divisions in battle and see how they are in terms of ammo and damage control. We can now direct the ships to find the enemy fleet and hopefully destroy it. I found the fleet and now it's time to attack. Two armoured cruisers against one doesn't sound fair, but I have two light cruisers with me for the backup, and they can do some damage to it. I managed to isolate one and sink it with no ship sunk to my own. Great success. Lots of VP, victory points I think, and I get a really good head start against the USA. The next battle was a night engagement between two light cruiser forces, which really was confusing. After a couple of hours, I decided to pull back and not risk my light cruisers anymore. I lost two destroyers in the action, but took one of theirs. By the looks of it, the Americans have called it quits, and they are willing to give me a load of land for me to stop beating them up, which I was surprised with as our main battle fleets didn't clash. I took it and I moved my forces back to the main enemy, Germany. And that's about it for Rule the Waves 3. I do really enjoy this game quite a bit, and I hope to play more of it soon. I do need to touch on Carrier Warfare, as it is one of the best parts of the game, but for now I'll leave it for here. If you do like the video, please give it a like.